Well, good evening, everybody, and thank you so much for joining us on this beautiful Tuesday for Global Math Department. My name is Jessica Bogie, and I'm your host this evening. Tonight, we're going to hear from, um, sorry, I just I was on the wrong screen, Tawana Young, all about Beyond the Right Answer, math tasks that foster agency and identity. Before we begin our session, I would like to tell you a little bit more about the Global Math Department in case this is your first time here. The Global Math Department is an organization that is run entirely by volunteers. To keep the free, high-quality TV, we need webinar speakers, webinar hosts, and writers for our newsletter. Newsletter writers share about an area of math or teaching that resonates with them or even discusses a recent math blog they came across that would help teachers reflect on their practice. If you would like to volunteer or know someone who would be great in any of these areas, please have them email us at globalmathdepartment at gmail.com or have them reach out to us on Twitter. So let's get started with our webinar. Before I introduce our speaker, I'd like to explain a little bit how these meetings work. They are recorded and are available typically about 24 hours after the meeting ends. To view the recording, you can use the same link that you used to get here tonight, which is also the same way you would share it with others. If there are teachers in your department or uh, friends that you would like to share it with, you can give them that same email and the link from the email. The Global Math Department community prides itself on being friendly and supportive. The chat room is available for topical and general conversation throughout the meeting. Um, both of us will be sure to catch questions for the presenter as needed to be addressed during the presentation or at the end of the presentation. So tonight, our topic is all about math tasks that foster agency and identity. And, oops, sorry. and let's learn a little bit about our speaker before we get started. Juana is the Vice President of Curriculum and Instruction at MIND, where she leads the overall vision, strategy, and execution for curriculum materials, resources, and professional learning across MIND's suite of products. She also leads MIND's educator community, MEND, Math, Equity, and Design. Juana is a former classroom teacher, district coach, and district curriculum director for math, science, and instructional technology with over 20 years of experience in education. She has been a leader in improving schools at the local, state, and national levels, developing and implementing curriculum assessments, coaching programs, STEM learning pathways, and professional development training for teachers. So, it is now your turn. All right. Well, welcome, now everyone. Welcome everyone. I'm really excited to be here tonight and share a little bit of um, some of the, the things that I've been working on. Um, so we're going to dive in and we're going to get started. Um, I want to tell you a little bit more about myself. So you heard about me educationally and so I want to just tell you a little bit more about myself. Um, so I am from Ohio. That's actually where I'm at right now um, in Ohio and Ohio, if you don't know, I don't know how many of you know much about Ohio, but um, Ohio is known for our football team, Ohio State, and I am a giant Ohio State fan. So if you are also an Ohio State fan, let me hear it in the chat. Go ahead and type I am or type go OSU or go Bucks in the chat if you are an Ohio State fan. I don't see anybody typing in the chat yet, so I'm going to have to convince you as part of this. I see it. Go OSU. All right. So um, so besides the Buckeyes in Ohio, we, uh, we're we called the Buckeyes because of this nut. So a Buckeye is actually a nut. It's a poisonous nut that grows on a tree, um, but we love them. And so we drill holes in them and we make necklaces and we wear them. Oh, somebody put go Michigan. I just can't do that. So, um, <laughs> so the thing, um, the other thing about Ohio that I really, really love is the fact that we have a cheer that we do all the time. So um, it's a cheer where we just spell out Ohio. People run around and they yell OH and other people yell IO. So I'm wondering how many of you I can get to do this with me. So I'm just going to say OH and then you're going to type IO. And let's see how many of you will be willing to do that. So here we go. OH. Let's see those IOs in the chat. IO, IO. Look at all those IOs. I love it. I'm going to type an IO too because you can't leave a OH with a, without an IO. 
All right. So <laughs> that's great. So why did I do all that? Like, why did I spend time just to talk about Ohio? Because being from Ohio is part of how I identify. I it's, uh, it's rooted in my identity of who I am. I love the Buckeyes. I love being from here. I love the little quirky things we do. And I'm sure you all have that same thing. You have a place that you're from, that you love, um, that is part of who you are. And so we're talking tonight about how do we foster identity and agency in students. And part of that is really like unpacking and sitting and thinking about who we are. And so um, we're going to dig right in. I'm going to um, share a few tools that you're going to need for this training. I like to be um, very interactive when I talk. And so for today's session, we're going to be using the chat, which you guys are all used to now. We're going to be using reaction buttons. Um, and these are the buttons that we'll be using. And then if you have your smartphone handy, we're also going to use the photo app on your phone because I have some interactive activities um, that I'd like us to do today. So those are the tools that we're going to be needing for today's session. Um, so I want to go back to the title. So the title is Beyond the Right Answer, Math Tasks That Foster Agency and Identity. And one of the quotes that I really love um, is from Phil Darrow. He, he says, after the answer is out of the way, the mathematics begins. And he actually has a, a video where he's he goes into more depth and he's talking about this. But I love this, this statement right here because so many of our students feel like math begins and ends at the answer. Like that's the thing, like to get to the answer. And there's so much that you can do, so much you can learn about thinking and about math when you think about beyond that answer. And so for today, we're gonna really dig into three questions for our agenda. And this is all centered around this idea of going beyond the right answer, really getting to what math is. So one of the questions, and if you're familiar with Catalyst for Change, you'll, you'll recognize this. Who is a doer of math? Who is a knower of math? And who is a sense maker of math? And so these are some of the questions that I ask myself and my team and I, we talk about this a lot because kids get messages that this is not them. And so we need to examine and think about where these messages come from. So I want to start by just talking about a student that I had in my class, in my sixth grade math class, named Dante. And as I tell the story of Dante, if anything I say about Dante resonates with you, go ahead and click that thumbs up emoji. If anything I say about Dante resonates with you. So we're just going to click that thumbs up emoji. So Dante um, was a student in my sixth grade class. And the one of the things that he um, did on the very first day of school is he walked up to me and he said, Mrs. Young, I can't do math. I used to be good at math until fractions. And so here was this kid who was a sixth grader who thought way back in third grade that he'd reached the height of his math ability, that there was no more, no more places for him to go. And that fractions was the thing that did him in. And too many of our kids, they, they feel like that out there um, in our classrooms all over, all over the world, all over the country, they feel like that. And so he was letting me know what his expectations of himself were and then telling me what my expectations of him should be. And so we have kids that sit in our classrooms like this and they think about when they're they're waiting to be called on. And one of the things I get to do is I work, I have a group called MEND that's made up of educators across the country and they help us design really cool um, programs and curriculums. And we also have a, a family group, a teacher, a student and a parent group. And they have to join together. If a student joins, their family has to be part of it too. And one of the things in doing this, we get to know the families. And so we get to hear a lot about the struggles and the anxieties that people have experienced. And so if you think about the kids in our classroom that are like Dante and they sit there and they they try to shrink and not be called on and they wonder when it comes time for math, these things cross their minds. Like, what if I'm wrong? 
what if they laugh at me? What if I look stupid or make mistake or I don't understand or I can't do it? Or what if I fail? And these are messages that come to their mind. And so we have to ask ourselves, like, where do these thoughts come from? And so part of the work that I get to do at my organization is we are a math and a neuroscience um, organization, education organization. And so we do a lot of work around um, how our brain learns. And so one of the things that we talk a lot about are schemas. Does anybody know what schemas are? I'm going to type into the chat if you have some thoughts about what schema, what we might mean by schema. Organization of ideas. Okay. Any other thoughts about schema? All right. So um, schemas are actually neural networks. They're our brains way of organizing our thoughts and experiences. And so when we experience things, um, our brain files them away. So there's um, when we perceive something, we have a, it goes to our hippocampus. And so um, we form our thoughts and we form our understandings of stuff based on our experiences. It's like a blueprint. If you think about a blueprint that, um, that your brain makes so that you can relate to the world because it's how we relate to the world. So we do, we do a lot of work um, just trying to figure out how can we create um, products that really help build strong mathematical schemas for students. And so I want to dig in a little bit about what schemas, like give you a better idea of schemas. And so I want um, us to think about the things we have schemas on. And so if everybody, I know it's weird because it's, um, it's a uh, virtual thing, but if everybody would close their eyes and make a picture in your mind, so I'm going to say something and I'd like you to make a picture of it in your mind. Is everybody ready? B. So get a picture of that in your mind. B. And now open your eyes. And if this is what you saw in your mind, and it might not look exactly like this picture, but the letter B, go ahead and give me a thumbs up emoji. Let me reset this real quick. All right, go ahead and give me a thumbs up emoji if that's the letter if you thought about a letter B. So we've got some folks that thought about a letter B. And we we don't, we know these are Bs. Like there are some fonts here that we haven't seen, but we can recognize that these are the letter B. Give me a thumbs up if this is what you thought of. If this is more in line with the Bs that you thought of. I see some thumbs up coming in the chat. Yeah, I like to um, think about not those bees, but these bees, because these bees look better to me. So um, bees are things that we know about. We have different varying experiences about them. So varying schemas about bees. Some people know all kinds of things about bees. Some people understand that there are nearly 20,000 known species of bees in the world. And people might know exactly where they live. And some people might be able to distinguish a honeybee from a wasp, from a bumblebee, from a carpenter bee. Some of these, some people can do a lot of things. Some people are beekeepers. And so they know all about how bees make honey and all of these things. And that's a schema that they have. And then there are some people whose schema about bees is fear. Because maybe they are allergic to bees. Maybe they got stung by bees. And so their schema when they see bees, is to be afraid. And unfortunately, that's a math schema that some of our kids have. When they come to math class, there's a fear that comes with them because they've identified themselves as not being able to do math. And so math is one of those things that we all have schemas about. We have schemas about operations and how they work. We have schemas about fractions. And for some kids, fractions is the thing. It's the hurdle that they can't overcome. How many of us have heard adults talk about that? 
some people, um, once you start doing things like pi and um, doing things where you're using variables, there's those jokes that talk about, I was good at math until they start using letters. So there are some times where um, it's a it's a concept that help that people get to and then they feel like they can't do math anymore. And so one of the things that makes this so important is because of the scheme of the experience that I have with math and the way that I relate to it directly, um, directly makes me think about my identity as a math person. Because remember, schemas help us make sense of the world and our place in it. It's all based on our experiences that we've had. And so that makes kids start to wonder who gets to be powerful in math. A lot of times kids feel like math is a place where they were sorted and selected into kids that can and kids that can't. And so when they are, uh, when they are faced with an activity in math, their reaction is fear. And that makes it hard to really feel like you have agency in any of that. And that you have that you can be have the identity of a math person in any of that. So I want to um, show you a really quick video. And as you watch this video, I want you to think of two things that stand out to you from this video. And this is from um, a campaign that was done a few years ago called "With Math I Can Change the Equation." Did it, um, and they were trying to send this message of, yes, you can do math. So as you listen to this, think of two things that stand out to you from the video, and I'm going to ask you to type those into the chat. How do you feel about math? I'm not good at math. I just don't get it. It makes me kind of feel uncomfortable. When I get called on in math class, I feel scared. Because I'm afraid I'm going to mess up the problem. My brain just doesn't think anymore, doesn't think straight. I just go like, okay, what do I do? I have no idea what to do. That makes me feel stupid. Scared that I would answer wrong or get laughed at. I'll never be able to do this. 16, take one, Parker. I'm still learning who I am, but I'm good at. Forming my idea of my own potential. And if I think I can't be good at math, I won't be. But math is everywhere. Math is a basic life skill. Without math, I could get left behind. So help me know that limits don't exist. That math isn't beyond my reach. And my potential can take me anywhere. That with hard work and the right mindset, I can grow. Because math esteem is self-esteem. With math, I can be a fashion designer, a doctor, a computer programmer. A wildlife biologist. A teacher. With math, I can be anything. So think about two things that stood out to you from that video and type them into the chat. Fear and shame, fixed mindset versus growth mindset, the negative feelings. It was the same people, but a change in the beliefs. Too much focus on the correct answer instead of the process, growth mindset, change in word choice. Absolutely. Change of perspective. And that's what um, that's one of the things that we've been working on the past couple of years is figuring out strategies and ways to really help kids foster that identity and agency and really change this idea that there are math people. I saw earlier in the chat that somebody said that parents have the same mindset. Like you probably had parents do this at a parent teacher conference, say something like, oh, well, no wonder they can't do it. I can't do math. And then kids start to think that it's genetic. Like they can't do math. I can't do math. And it's, it's not a true thing. And so it's hard to like help kids overcome that. And so one of the things that, um, that this video really stands out to me is uh, like a lot of you said, this mindset of being able to do math and the fear that some of these kids feel. And so that goes back then to the math schemas that we have. 
Because some kids feel like their intelligence is fixed. And so many people tie their intelligence to math. When people find out you like math, how many of you um, people have said, oh, you must be so smart? Has anybody ever had that? If you have, just give me a thumbs up in the chat. If you've ever had somebody say that to you or a plus one, that works too. Yeah, people say that all the time when they find out that you're doing something with math because people feel like there's intelligence there that doesn't exist in other places. And so when kids feel like they tie their intelligence to math and they feel like they can't do math, well, then they feel like there's there's not really many things that they can do. And so it's super important that we change this mindset. There's actually a study that was done by Peterman and Ewing in 2019, and it found that second graders with a fixed mindset suffered from math anxiety. And Joe Bowler actually um, wrote an article about the personal and the educational consequences of math anxiety. And she said in her article that math anxiety affects 50% of the U.S. population and more women than men. And they also found that it started early, as young as age five. And so if you think about being five years old and having math anxiety, think about how much that snowballs over the years and how every time you get something wrong, every time that you uh, make a mistake, it's just a reinforcement of, yes, I can't be a math person. And so these are the things that we have to change. And children start to avoid things and they just get worse as they get older. One of the parents that we work with, she talks about how she had math anxiety when she was a student and she didn't get over it. And what it did for her whole life is it made it hard when she became an adult to actually have conversations when she got her first career, a job in her career about benefits. She couldn't negotiate that stuff because she felt so scared of the math and the conversation. And think about how many people that that affects. And so we have to do something about it. So we have to change this idea that there are people who can and can't do math. And so what I'm gonna ask you to do, let me clear the um, reactions. I wanna um, kind of do a little poll here to see which of these things you relate to. If you are a former recovering, not a math person, give me a thumbs up. If you're saying, silly, there's no such thing as a math gene, do the laughy face. If you uh, may have said this once or twice, or someone has said that to you, go ahead and give me the raised eyebrow. And if you've seen students realize that they are, they are math people, if you've seen that change in students, give me that face with the stars in the eyes. And so go ahead and find those reaction buttons and give me those reactions of, uh, to this little poll that we're going to take here. So I see uh, stars. That's great to see that. See some thumbs up. It's great. We love former recovering, um, not a math person. We love that. Yep. I see some laughy faces for there's no such thing as a math gene. But I'm really loving all of the ones that I see with the stars, all the ones that I see that saying you've seen students realize they are math people. And when that happens, Think about what that means, not just for them, but for their families to hear that, for their um, for generations to come. I have seen it affect generations when that change happens in kids. And so it's not just about the grade level. It's not just about um, getting kids to pass a certain thing. It's really about changing their lives. Because when you start to realize that you are a math person, that you are capable of thinking, that you are capable of doing this work, this, this thing that you think is just for some people, now all of a sudden it's for you, that changes things for them. And that's what we want to do because what we know from research is that there is not, there's no difference for between people who succeed and they don't, not in their brains. It's all about the approach to life and the messages they receive about their potential and those opportunities that we have to learn.
So think about if I don't think I'm a math person, I'm not going to take the opportunities to raise my hand. I'm not going to take the opportunities to admit my mistakes. I'm not going to take the opportunities to challenge myself and take risks. And so they're missing out on all of this learning because they have the schema that they can't do it. And it doesn't help that we amplify things in education that are deficit based. We amplify this idea that there's this giant, there's a gap that you are have doubled the loss, that you are far behind, that you don't meet the standard. And yes, we do have that. But if we are amplifying the deficits, all we're doing is reinforcing the fact that these kids think that they're not math people because we've told them that. And it's especially especially pervasive for children of color, because we see the headlines about that. We see those headlines about students of color have doubled the learning loss. And there are things that we, we need to think about this from a different standpoint, not a deficit-minded standpoint. Yes, we still need to help with the challenges, but let's amplify the strengths and build from there and help those students build new strengths. So not only do they build confidence, but they also start to change the schema that they have about themselves. And so that's what this, that's what we're going to talk about the rest of the time here. We're going to talk about how we change that schema. And I'm going to show you some ideas for math tasks that you can do to do. Because what we know about schema is that all schemas, you're either building new schema, you're either connecting schemas together or you are revising existing schemas. So these are the things we're either building, connecting, or revising the schemas that we have. And so if we look at the schema that we're talking about right now, it's the existing schema of, I am not a math person. And so one of the ways that we have been digging in to do this is thinking about well, what does it mean to be a math person? What does that really mean? and we're diversifying it. We're diversifying who can do math and who are doers in math. We want kids to be able to see what math really is and who are the people that do math. And so who are the people that do math? What does it mean to be a math person? You have to do math and you have to be a person and that's what it means. If you are a person and you're doing math, boom, you are a math person. Why? Because math is about thinking and all of us can think, therefore all of us can do math. This is the mantra that I had in my classroom with my kids. This is the mantra that I took with me to the district level and that I take in this work with the kids and with the, with the teachers and with the administrators and with the families, that math is a thinking subject. It is a way to help us relate to the world. And we want people to see that instead of thinking about it just being about what's in our book or the facts. And so what we're doing is we are revising this idea that I'm not a math person to the fact that math is a human endeavor. Therefore, we are all math people. And so one of the easiest ways, one of my favorite ways to tell people and to show people that is by thinking about what it means to do math as a person. And you can go back in history, and so I do. I go back to the Labombo bone. Has anybody ever heard of the Labombo bone before? The Labombo bone is the oldest known mathematical artifact, and it was found in sub-Saharan Africa. And what it does is it shows that from the beginning of time, people were doing math. That This is, um, that has 29 notches on it, and so there's different theories about what the notches are, but one of the things that people think about is that they were, um, it was like a calendar, a way to keep track of the moon cycles. But the fact is, is that it's a mathematical artifact. So you can take this and then you could talk to kids about the mathematical artifacts that they have in their own homes. We all have them. We all have a, like for my house, if I cannot find my two cup measuring cup, I have a blue cup that is in my um, cabinet. And I know that if I use that cup and I fill it up, it's going to be exactly, well, not exactly, but it'll be very close to 
two cups. So I use that cup to estimate measuring. There are people who use string when they can't find a measuring tape or they can't find a ruler to, to do that. Kids will use mathematical artifacts. They do that in their home. And so you show them the human connection that math is a human endeavor. And we can show you that cultures and your family culture use mathematical artifacts. So how can you sit there and tell us you're not mathematical? And so when we take this kind of approach, instead of this deficit-based approach, we take this very asset-based approach where we're centering the students, we're thinking about where they sit in their culture and with mathematics, we're promoting equity, it's culturally responsive, we're focused on their strengths, we're seeing them as the unique individuals, we're promoting the student-centered learning, we're fostering their growth, and we're celebrating their potential. And that's what it means to take an asset-based approach. So you're not doing this deficit-based. So when you think about tasks that you're going to create, think about the asset-based approach way to create these tasks. And part of that is really helping students connect the things that they're already doing. So one of the first things we have to do is help convince them that they are mathematical. So some of the ways to do that is to talk to them about ways in which they're already mathematical. So how many of you used to make these little fortune catchers? Used to do that little, the little fortune catchers. Um, I used to make them all the time. You have kids in your class probably that make them. Well, these fortune catchers are made up of fractional parts, eight eighths. You can use this to teach common denominators. So you have students that sit in your class that tell you they can't do fractions, but yet they make these fortune catchers. And so you can use that strength of making a fortune catcher and that paper folding that they did and use that to show them the ways in which they're mathematical and help them see the math in what they're doing and then connect it to the mathematics that you're doing in the classroom. Another way to do that is with your students to play video games. I don't play video games. I don't know how many of you play video games, but I am not very good at it. But they have these maps that are in them that are really cool. And they, um, I've watched my kids do it. And they like sit there and they plan out where they're going to go on the map. And so when kids are doing that, they're using spatial thinking to figure out where they're going to go, all these different moves they're going to make. And some maps even like move. And so they really have to think about where they were and now where they're going. And so there's a lot of spatial thinking in the maps that kids do in these video games. Yet those same kids will sit in your classroom and they'll tell you that they can't do multi-step problems, but they just did it on a map. And so really bringing in that um, tying in that strength that they have to do this and showing them ways in which they're mathematical to build off of. And then my favorite example, because Dante in my class used to do this all the time, is when you have students that beatbox or drum on the desks. Anybody have students like that, that drum on the desk all the time? Those students are keeping time in fractions. They're also using patterns. A really cool thing for kids that do that is to get them to draw out the patterns that they're doing. And then you can have great math conversations with them. Really cool ways to think with them about how did they know how long to draw the line and all of these things. And it's, it's really interesting. And you're opening up something that they didn't know they had. And so that's how we start to change their schema from I'm not a math person to of course you are. You're a human and everybody is a math person. You're changing that schema by showing them how they are already mathematical. Another schema that kids have is learning happens to me. There was, I was in a training once and um, somebody put up a poem and I don't know if their student wrote it or if they got it off the internet or something. So I can't properly cite this, but I thought it was very telling. So this said, school is a place where young people go to watch old people work and are graded on how well they watch. And so if that's how students are feeling about school, 
because the person doing all the talking, all the work, all the thinking is the teacher and the students are sitting there waiting to hear. How many of you have ever taught a lesson and you did, you gave great directions, the lesson was great, the directions were great, you turn it over for the kids to work independently and hands go up in the air and you ask them, what is it that you need? And they say, I don't understand. And you say, well, what don't you understand? And they say, everything. If that's ever happened to you, give me a plus one in the chat if that's ever happened to you. If you've ever had students do that. I see some plus ones in there. This is something that happens, something that students do because they wait. I used to call this, I read an article once about this and I took the name of it. Um, and I used to call this mama bird teaching. Like they wait for us to like, like you know how mama birds, like they sit there and their little baby birds wait with their beaks open for the mom to fill it up. We have kids that are just, they do that. They wait with their beaks open for us to fill it up and they don't take the risks and they don't try things like they should. And part of that's because of that schema that they carry. And yes, I see somebody wrote in the chat, learned helplessness. And so we have to change that. And so I read this um, article and I, I'm gonna share it with you today. It's called Never Say Anything a Kid Can Say by Stephen Reinhardt. And if you haven't read it, it's great. It is a great read. If you hold your phone up to that QR code, it will take you to a link that you that has that actual uh, PDF of this article. It is a really, really good article. Um, so I highly, highly encourage you to read it. And this became a mantra for me and my team. We were never gonna say anything a kid could say. I used to do this when I was a teacher. It drove my kids insane. They would ask me a question and I would answer their question with a question. And one day they said, Miss Young, aren't you getting paid to answer my questions? And I said, no, I'm getting paid to make you think. And so that was like a eye opener for them. And so this is a hard practice though, because we got into education because we love kids and we want to help them. And so we want to go and rescue them when they struggle. And so it's hard to, to, to not say things and not to help and not to guide, but I'm going to show you in a minute um, why that's so important. To, to not do that. We're gonna actually play a game here in a few minutes. Um, and so this is one of my favorite quotes when I think about this idea of learning happens to me. If they're the one, if we're the ones doing the work, then we're the ones learning, right? Because neurons are not firing if I'm not doing anything. And so if I'm doing all the work, I'm the one learning. And so students are not, so they're not having access to that power. We talk about knowledge is power, but we also have to ask, where have we given them access to that power? So if they're just repeating something that we did, then they're not really um, firing that neuron the way that they should. A lot of times what we call problem solving, we're really still just practicing something we already taught them. Problem solving should push them challenge them, push them so that they're on the limits of what they know. There's a great definition that NCTM has about problem solving. It's one of my favorites. And I can't remember it off the top of my head, but it goes something like this. It talks about pushing them to the limits of what they know. It should be a mathematical task that's, that is hard enough to challenge them. But a lot of times what's in our textbooks and what we call problem solving really is just practicing the thing that we told you, but now it's in a word problem. And so one of the things I'm going to show you in a, in a little bit in this talk are these thinking routines that you can adopt and put in your classroom to really push kids and get them to think. So if we're saying knowledge is power, we have to give kids access to the power. Information is liberating. So the thing about this that I love is that um, kids don't like to be wrong because they think that being wrong is bad. They think that failing is bad, making mistakes is bad, but mistakes and being wrong is part of the learning process. And so when they get new information, it should be liberating, whether it was because they were right or because they were wrong. So we need to make sure that we are holding them accountable for their thinking. 
And that's what helps them to be liberating, giving them the information that they need. And that's information that they can use to then make, adjust their thinking and, and practice and, and learn new things. And then the last line in here is education is the premise of progress in every society and in every family. And that is so, so important. So the way that we do this is we bring equity to who can contribute to math, who are the knowers of math, giving kids permission and saying, yes, you can contribute. So you want to bring equity in what it means to know and contribute to math. And so the way that never say anything a kid can say talks about is number one, never say anything a kid can say. And number two, ask good questions. Good questions that make kids think that don't have these really quick answers and ask more process questions than product because you want to get to the why. So ask more of those process questions. Um, I highlighted these three because these are the three that I'm really focused on today. Um, but we also need to replace lectures with sets of questions and we need to be patient. That's hard for some of us. It's hard for me. Um, so I want to play a game. This is a game that we have. Um, there are some free games on our site that you can play with your kiddos. Uh, this is a game called Big Seed. And so I'm going to just give you a second and let you scan this QR code. It'll go to your phone, but we're going to play it together in the interest of time. And I can put a link to it also in the chat because uh, it is a fun game to play. So I'm going to put this in the chat real quick. All right. So take a look at this. Actually, I'm going to this one is too easy. We're going to play a little bit harder. All right. Take a look at this. Anybody have any ideas of uh, what, what you might want to do with this? What you think the purpose of this is? You can type it into the chat. I see rotation. Patterns. So I'm gonna I'm gonna um, walk you, I'm gonna show you a couple things that this does. So I'm gonna I'm gonna show you this one. So you can see what we're trying to accomplish here. So when you see the little penguin, that means you got it right. So did you saw what I did there? Um, now that you know how this works, what would you do here? Well, what's some things that you notice? Why don't you type some things you notice into the chat? What are some things that you notice? It's a T-shape, three colors. What are some other things that you notice? Anything else? It's not symmetrical. Yes, this is GG math. Three patterns. Anybody want to type a guess as to what I could do here? Blue and yellow are both singletons, right? So I'm gonna, I see sorting. So I'm gonna show you a couple things just in the interest of time. So if I did that, and then I did that, Oh, somebody said put a pink in the remaining spot. And I put a blue there so I can put a pink in the remaining spot. 
And now I can change colors. So if I change colors and I do that, that didn't quite work. So I'm gonna do what we, we had before. Now, did that give you any clues? So I could do this and then it works. So I'm going to, you have the link, you can play with the game. Um, but as you're, as you're doing it, I want to show you kind of what this does for kids. So I was talking earlier about schema and I started to talk a little bit about the perception action cycle. So this is the way that our brain learns. So we see something. So you saw that and you told me a couple of things like sorting and patterns and it wasn't symmetrical. And so your brain goes to your existing scheme of what you know about things that look like that. And we made a prediction and then we tried something, we took an action and then we perceived the outcome. And if the outcome is right, it reinforces our schema. If it's wrong, it causes us to build new schema. And that's the way that the perception action cycle works with our brain. And so this game is designed to work that way. But you don't have to have a game like this to take kids through this cycle. So I'm going to show you something that we have called the problem solving process. And this is something that you can use. Now I put a... Um, there's a little QR code to an article called, a white paper called The Art of Facilitation, and it talks about this. And you're welcome. It's a free thing. You're welcome to have that and start to utilize this because it talks about how to use this. So what this uh, problem solving process does is it has kids notice and wonder. That's how you get kids to enter into the problems that you're doing. So if you're doing a word problem, if you're doing some other kind of task, Ask them to notice and wonder about it. Lots of us have used the notice and wonder um, strategy. But the key thing is getting them to make a prediction of what they think is going to happen and tell you why, and then test it and see what happens. And then analyze what they saw. How did what they see compare to what they thought was going to happen and what did they learn from it? And the key is, is that kids will go through this cycle multiple times, as many times as they need to until they learn it, and then they can connect it to other things. And the beauty is, is it's all, they're doing the whole thing. So it's very asset-based because they're, it's their potential to learn. They're building their strengths and they're building their own capabilities. And that's what's happening as they go through this problem-solving process. So they are engaged in the thinking and they're having to do all of this thinking. So they start by no the notice and wonder, but then you get them to just make predictions. So they can do this when they're getting ready to solve a problem. They can do this when they're getting ready to do a task. Um, and you're gonna see that here in a few minutes of other ways that you can use this. Um, so we're revising this schema so that students know that they're an active participant in their learning and that they can think through challenges and their thinking is important. And that's what this problem solving process does. It makes kids think through the, think through, um, the activities that they're doing. And so this is important because we know from research that a student's belief about their learning is related to their performance. If they believe that they're going to get smarter, they're going to show the greater persistence in learning. And so we want our kids to do that. And so this takes us to our last schema. Getting the right answer is what's most important. That's an existing schema. And so we want to change that schema. We want students to think about it. And the way we do that is help them uh, see the math around them. We can do some really rich tasks to help them see the math around them. 
And so we do that by uh, bringing in inclusion. Who are the sense makers of math? Who are the math powerhouses? So we wanna include various ways that students think about math and the strategies they use to make sense of math. We want them to see that they're math powerhouses. So what we wanna do is we can do these things called thinking routines. Interesting problems that challenge kids to explore their thoughts and share their thinking. The focus is not the answer, but it's on the thinking that they do. So you wanna talk them through, what are the things that you notice? What are the things that you wonder? What do you think is gonna happen and why? Try it out, what do you see? What did you learn? That's that problem solving process that we're taking them through. And you can do it in really interesting ways because it's really hard um, to get students to do this kind of thing where they let go of the right answer. So you just have to take the right answer away. So one of the ways that I do that is through this thing called a math wonder. This is what I call the dually tile. It is not a real, that's not the real name. I was doing a workshop in an elementary school called Dooley Elementary, and I was in the bathroom and I saw this tile and I got so excited that I took a picture and ran out and we spent the rest of the time talking about the math in this tile. Just giving kids something like this to let them notice and wonder and think about the kinds of math that they see, the kinds of investigations they might want to do. You don't ever have to do an investigation to have a rich conversation with kids around something like this, this image, this picture, thinking about all of the different math. But you don't even have to have a picture. You could do something with a uh, question. So sometimes I'll ask a question like, how many tennis balls can you fit into a mailbox? Or how many people would it take to stretch from one end zone to the other? And these are just questions that they're, they are thinking about, but they're not, they feel like they don't have to have the right answer. So it helps them really start to let go of that and really focus on their thinking and focus on the math strategies that they would have to use and focus on the ideas that they can come up with um, and then figure out ways to investigate them. And it's really great when you get kids talking to each other, trying to figure out, I would have investigated it this way. Oh, this is what I'm thinking that we're going to learn from this. And they start to make math connections. I've done this with kids as first graders. I've done this and asking them different kinds of questions um, and just things for them to think about. And this is just a great way just to get them in the practice of thinking. This is another thing. This is called a data sign in. And a data sign in is something where you take a question um, and that has multiple answers and you let kids answer it. And it's, we call it a data sign in. What we used to do is when they walked in the door, uh, there was a question and they would answer it at the sticky note or they would write something, but it's anonymous. So you want to take a risk and it helps the kids because they're taking these risks and you can do it in the morning when they come in and then you could talk about it later. And the great thing about these is it's data that they've collected themselves. So they care about it and you can talk about the patterns in it. Um, do you agree with everything that's up here? Um, can we make a graph of this information? So there's all kinds of things that you can do. And so you're giving them the agency to answer the question that the way that they want to. It's safe because I didn't put my name on it. So if I got it wrong, they're still able to have that conversation about errors. And it doesn't feel like everybody's looking at them because people don't know which part was theirs. Um, and so that's a really, a really cool way to, to do this. And then I have one uh, for you all to do, and, and I'm, I see that I'm running out of time here. So I'm just gonna give you like 45 seconds. If you wanna scan that with your phone, it's a data sign-in that, um, that you can participate in because this is another fun way to do it, especially if you have older kids or you're using iPads, you can use a Padlet and then you can just continue to collect all of the, um, all of the answers to that. And then you can do all kinds of really cool things with them in the classroom. And so I'll just give you just a couple more seconds on that one. And so this was all about revising that schema about the right answer is what's most important. And so it's about developing strategies and ways of thinking about math understanding the how and the why of the math 
not just the what. So really helping kids see that their strategies are important. And what I found is it's really important to get them to name their strategy, to name it, to call it something, because then they can evaluate where the error was. Was it in my strategy? Did I make a computation mistake? It's just, it brings a level of ownership when they're naming them. And the other thing that it does is it helps position them in the classroom. So when I when kids are sharing their strategies, when you do these tasks, like let's say you're doing a math wonder and you're letting kids share their strategies and how they're thinking about it, it's great to name that strategy after that student because what you've just done is position that student as a mathematical resource for the rest of the students to see. And that's a really powerful thing to do to help build that identity for students. And so we want to make sure that there's this focus on the strategies and the ways in which kids think about math and really the understanding of the how and the why. And one of the things that I'll end with is from this book called Pedagogy of Confidence. Dr. Yvette Jackson wrote this and she talks about when we have the confidence about the potential of students, we push them to the outskirts, the limits of their mind, and learning becomes something that pulls a student's potential to the next level. Every one of these tasks that I've talked about, at the center of that is a student's potential. There's Because the answer is not the focus of it, because it's the thinking, every student has the potential to have a good strategy that's going to feed another student's strategy or that we can share in class or that we can build off of. Even if it's not a right strategy, you can have a conversation about that strategy and use that as a way to get to some really good, powerful thinking. And so what we want to do is the next time a question comes up, who's a doer of math, who's a knower of math, who's a sense maker of math, we want our students to say, I am. That's what we want from them. So I thank you so much for your time. We have like three minutes. Um, so if there are questions, I can take some questions for the next three minutes. I'm always trying to get Twitter followers. If you want to follow me on Twitter, there's my Twitter handle. And I don't know if I missed questions, Jessica, if there were some in there. No, I was paying attention and you were covering things and it was fantastic. This I this was probably the perfect webinar to kick off the school year. Absolutely fantastic. Any questions before I wrap everything up and end? our session here. All right, well, I do appreciate you sharing with us um, and taking the time this to prepare your presentation and to share with us. And thank you for everyone that attended. Um, I know that as school year is getting started, our time is valuable and I hope that you found value in our presentation tonight. So thank you so much for joining us. Um, the next webinar is on Tuesday, August 23rd, and its title is Mathematics, All Are Welcome, All Belong. And the description is, come and explore some Martian math, the fourth dimension, and unit chats. We'll explore some high leverage strategies that will engage students from counting to exploring polynomials. Be ready to have some fun with math. And this is by Dave Martin. So. Um, I always like to say we're always on the same bat channel, same time, um, every other Tuesday. And um, hopefully we'll see you at another Global Math Department webinar this school year. So thank you so much, everybody. Make sure that you take time to follow new people, and we will see you later. Thank you so much for joining us. <laughs>